that's right. So now what are you gonna be doing? The nursing intervention. So it's gonna be the implementation. What's in the nursing intervention? What are you giving to the patient? Medication. Medication, what kind of medication you're gonna give? First of all, you're gonna give antibiotics and the doctor has ordered it. And then what else you give? Antipyretics, antipyretics, all right? So antipyretics, because the patient is like, you know, the body is like fatigued, they're tired, all right? So then the antipyretics you're gonna be giving. And then what are you gonna give? Also nutritious food, right? So, and then so that they can eat. So those are the nursing uh, interventions. And setting priorities, what does that mean? Say it again. Is that the planning? Is your priority? Very good. It's a, it's the planning. So the setting of the priorities. If you have multiple nursing diagnoses, which one is the most priority to be taken care of? Is this clear? Okay. Very good. Okay. Now the other thing is the pulse. So what is the pulse? What does it indicate? The heart rate. The heart rate. So what does that mean? So like how many times the heart is pumping? Is this clear? All right, so that's the heart rate. Okay, now, so what is the normal heart rate? 60 to 100. 60 to 100 is normal, all right. So for the heart rate to happen, okay, so. Um, for the heart rate to ha happen, what do we need? Like, okay, so you, you can, when you're hearing, you see, lap dap lap dap lap dap lap dap so what is it like there is a movement for that reason you're having those sounds right so lap dap lap dap is like the valves are closing for that reason there is the heart sound of s1 and s2 we do we wouldn't have heard the the the, the noise if the valves were not closing it's like when the heart uh, the valves are closing okay so now this is the so this is the tricuspid valve and then there is the mitral valve. Okay, so, so this is the tricuspid valve and this is the mitral valve. When these two valves close, then we hear lop. Okay, so in other words, why did you hear the voice? Because there was a movement. Is that clear? All right, so now, then we have the uh, pulmonic valve and then the aortic valve, all right? So this is the pulmonic valve and this is the aortic valve. When these two valves close, then we hear S2, dub. Is that clear? So in other words, when you're hearing lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, all right, so it's S1 and S2. And so like every time like there is um, the, this, the, the, the heart is pumping and then the blood is going out of the aorta, so like you're counting those pulse rate to see the pulse of the patient so how why how did this like this contraction is happening the contraction is happening because we have the SA node here SA node and then we have the AV node here we have the AV node AV node here okay and then from the AV node all these electric impulses are going to the ventricles and the ventricles are contracting so you have to understand the heart has a plumbing and the heart has electric. What was the plumbing? The valves are part of the plumbing. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. And for the muscle to contract, to squeeze, to push the blood out is the electric. Am I making sense, guys? All right, so now for the electricity to travel, it travels from the SA node to the AV node. Imagine that like, you know, you have those two electric poles and then there is a wire from one pole to the other. Are you imagining? All right, so now there is a pole here. What's the name of this electric pole? SA node. What's the uh, name of the electric pole here? AV node, all right. So now there is a wire, imaginary wire, that the electricity travels from here to here. Are you with me? Once the electricity comes here, then like it kind of disperses around the muscles and then the electric shock is given to the muscle and the muscle contracts. Is that clear? Because without that electric shock, that is hitting the muscle, the ventricular muscle, the ventricle doesn't contract. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so then, you know, because this muscle contracted, all right, so like it's pushing the blood out of the aorta. Is that clear, guys? Mm -hmm. So now you're counting that 
as the pulse rate. Am I making sense? Okay. Now, sometimes when you're checking the pulse, you have an elderly man. You check the pulse. The pulse is 40. What is it? It's very low, right? Mm -hmm. So the minimum has to be 60. 40, are you, are you like worried that there is 40 pulse? Yes, you're gonna call the doctor, 40 pulse. So first things first, like you're gonna be thinking, why did this patient has 40, what happened? So now you go to the anatomy and physiology. So remember that, you know, so from here to here, the electric currents have to travel, and from here, it's gonna disperse on the ventricular muscle to contract so that you can have the first pulse. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Then the same thing happens again, the second pulse, the second pulse. So how many pulses, contractions you're gonna be having in a minute? 6,200, right? Mm -hmm. Now how many did you get? 40, why? You know why? The first thing that you're gonna be thinking, it's a block from SA node to AB node. Am I making sense? So if this electric impulse didn't travel from here to here, then there is less of an electricity going to the muscle, then there is less frequently the muscle is contracting. Am I making sense, guys? So now, clinically, how is this patient presenting with a pulse of 40? All right, the only thing that you're seeing is the pulse. Are you seeing this? No, but that you kind of deriving that out of 40 pulse because this thing has happened inside. Are you with me, guys? So for that reason, this patient, obviously you're gonna be making sure that they're not exerting a lot of work because they don't even have energy, right? If you have 40 pulse. So what are they gonna be putting? They're gonna be putting a pacemaker. Is this clear? So this patient is gonna be getting an artificial SA node that it's gonna be making the electric impulses travel on a set time, on a set time. Am I making sense, guys? So that patient is gonna be having a pacemaker. So did you see like why the pulse is important now? Okay, so this is one example only, right? Okay, yes. No, that was my question about the pacemaker. Yeah, this is the pacemaker. All right, so then, yes. Is, is AFib also corrected with a pacemaker? No, it, uh, yeah, uh, oh, it, it, yes, it could be, you know why? Because now what happens that, all right, so because from SA node to the AB node, the electricity didn't travel, and the SA node waits here, like, wait a minute, like why am I not getting any impulse? Like I'm supposed to get the impulse. So the AB node, like, you know, it, it says, you know, if, if I'm not gonna get the impulse, I'm gonna create an impulse. Does that make sense? So it starts creating in, in, impulses haphazardly. So what is that? Supraventricular tachycardia. Now this patient has 100, 101, 102 blood, uh, pulse. Like wh where did this come from? So then, okay, so like, it's gonna be, oh, because from SA node to AV node, there is no impulse, and then so AV node is not gonna be sitting idle, it created in its own impulse. Obviously it's gonna be haphazard, because it wasn't the right way of doing it, now like we have tachycardia. Mm. All right, so then like that can be corrected with pacemaker or medication, obviously. Or medication. Do you see now? So do you see like the importance of the pulse? Okay, so, all right, very good. So this is also one, uh, uh, one, one example that I gave. And then so when we're the, 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 the checking the pulse, so where, what are we doing? We're touching. So can you get the, you know, I mean, obviously you can check the pulse with, uh, with your, a stethoscope, but most of the time, like we're doing it with, with our hand, all right? So, or it can be done with the stethoscope, is that clear? So when you touch the patient to get the pulse, what are you doing? Palpating. Every time you touch a patient, what are you doing? You're palpating. Does that make sense? Touch is palpation. All right, so now, when you're palpating for the pulse, so what are you feeling? You feel the rate, the rhythm, and the strength all right uh, and the strength what is the strength you know like how do we uh, how do we assess it plus one plus two plus three plus four on a standard basis what should it be it should be plus two plus two is the normal in other words am i making sense guys plus two all right so plus two sometimes like with the peripheral pulses because it's far from the heart what's going to be the, the strength it's going to be plus one and that's normal also is that clear? Okay. 
All right, respiration. So what is the respiration? So how many times like we're breathing, right? Per, per minute. What is the normal? 12 to 20. 12 to 20, very good. So when you are uh, assessing for the respiration, do you say to the patient that I'm gonna be assessing your respiration? No, no you don't say it because then the patient is gonna be nervous and he's, they're not gonna be breathing. Is that clear? The best principle is when you're checking the pulse, and then so you're done with the pulse, don't remove your hand, and then now like check the patient's chest, whether like how many times it is rising, what is the patient gonna think? Because like you're still touching the pulse, then they, they're gonna think that you're still checking the pulse, but in the meantime, you're counting their breathing. Am I making sense? Is that a good strategy? All right, so the other thing that when you're doing the pulse, how many fingers you can use, you can use your, uh, this uh, three fingers, you know, your index, your middle, like you're, you're touching like this, and you're, uh, you're checking the pulse. You never check with your thumb, because like this has pulse, you don't know like, are you counting your pulse or you're counting the patient's pulse? Is that clear? So we always check it with our three fingers like this, okay? All right, so in, uh, in 307, we're learning how to check the carotid pulse, and then we're gonna be learning how to do brachial pulse, the radial pulse, and then the, pop, um, the, the dorsalis pedis and then posterior tibialis. We're not checking inguinal. And then so for a reason, like in your paper number two, don't write that you check the inguinal because like, okay, so it's a lie, you're not checking. <laughs> so, because the sample paper says it, the students copy it. So, and I know that, that you're not supposed to touch the genital area for our course in 307, so you didn't do the inguinal. Does that make sense, guys? Please don't write anything that you didn't do. Okay, yes. So we're counting how many times like the chest rises. Rises up and, and down, okay. yeah. Yes, okay. okay, very good. All right, so now, what does that mean? The process of the ventilation, O2 and then carbon dioxide exchange. Okay, so every time like we're uh, doing uh, respiration, so what are we doing? Like we're taking in the oxygen and then we're exhaling the carbon dioxide. So there is inspiration and there is exhalation. So is this like, do you think, do we think, oh, okay, like, you know, I'm gonna inhale now. Oh, I'm gonna exhale now. No, we don't think, like, it is spontaneous. And then what is the phase between inhalation and exhalation? They're equal. Normally, it's equal. So in other words, like, the time it takes for the, the time it takes uh, for the air to come in and the time it takes the air to come out is equal. Am I making sense, guys? Uh, so, if it's not equal, there's a disease process. Is that clear? And then it has to be spontaneous. All right, so the other thing that like, I'm gonna be ch uh, telling you, all right, so if in COPD, all right, so if chronic bronchitis, for example, so this is the bronchial tree, these are the lungs, this is the lungs, and then we have all this alveoli. Alveoli is where the gas exchange is happening. Okay, so the alveoli are, are these little air sacs where the gas exchange happens. We have 300 million, we have 300 million alveoli. Does that make sense? So in other words, we have a lot of air sacs for the oxygen and then the carbon dioxide to exchange. Or if it is a spontaneous, why? Because like it's a spontaneous process, we don't have to think about it. And exhalation and inhalation, they're the same phase as far as like the length. All right, so what happens that a lot of times, like if I'm a smoker, a smoker, a smoker, a smoker, so what am I doing? The irritant, it's an irritant, the smoke is irritant. So if it like that irritant comes and the scratches, the scratches here, the scratches here, right? It's a scratching because it's an irritant. What is the body gonna do? It's gonna be producing the sputum because what is the body saying? Okay, like if I produce this secretion, the sputum, and if this patient, <coughs> cuffs and then expectorates, what's gonna to happen to the irritant? Irritant is gonna be flushed out. Oh. Am I making sense? So this is the body's way of cleaning that air, uh, that, that passageway. Am I making sense, guys? So like if I'm chain a smoker, so like, okay, so the body's producing the sputum. So what am I doing? Like, more, uh, I'm not, I should be like not doing anything but the cuff and expectorate, cuff and expectorate. Does that make sense? So for that reason, so like this is like chronic bronchitis, the sputum is more than my ability to expectorate. Am I making sense? So what's gonna happen? There is gonna be some sputum left behind and it's gonna dry. So what did it do to the lumen? 
it made it narrower, right? So for that reason, when you see somebody with chronic bronchitis, their exhalation rate phase is longer than the inhalation phase. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So like I gave this example to show that like during disease process, inhalation and exhalation phases can be different, but normally if everything is working well, inhalation and exhalation, they are equal and without thinking, we don't think it happens. Am I making sense guys? So this, this person, how is he gonna exhale like this? With a pursed lip, so that like he can push that energy to exhale that carbon dioxide out. Why? Because the lumen is half blocked with a lot of remnants of the sputum. Okay, did I make sense? Okay, guys, so if the exhalation and inhalation are not equal, what does that imply? <coughs> this is process. Is that clear? Okay, very good. Okay, so what is our O2 set? How much oxygen is in our Yeah, how much oxygen we have saturation? So what should it be? 95. 95. 95. Okay, so so it's gonna be high 90s, right? So all right. So like anything like uh, uh, if there is also, also disease process, it's gonna go low, 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 right? So, okay, lower. So Medicare, like you know, if you're gonna be having oxygen in the house, like I have, I was a case manager, you know, like uh, for with all chronic uh, diseases. So you are qualified for oxygen if your O2 set drops into 88 percent. All right. So otherwise, you're not qualified for home oxygen because it is going to be paid by Medicare, right? Okay, so so for Medicare to pay it, it's 88%. Okay, so um, yeah. Nowadays, like the nurses, they we're always doing the auto set because that little uh, gadget is so practical. All right, so okay, very good. Okay, so the next thing is the blood pressure. So what is the blood pressure? It is going to show systolic and diastolic. What is systolic? What is diastolic? Systolic is the heart rate, heart rate and the diastolic is the low relaxation. Okay, all right, what is it? Yeah, good. Systolic is the, the maximum amount of pressure when the heart contracts, and then the diastolic pressure is what's the pressure left in the system um, after the blood has gone. Yeah, very good. I mean, so in simple English, the systolic is like when there is a stress, how hard the heart is working. And diastolic is when the heart is at, re at rest, all right? So now, like, where are you? Like, okay, you're resting. So, like, in other words, the systolic and then, so what's the normal? 120 over 80, right? So, okay, so the systolic is, like, the, there, there is no resistance. The diastolic is when the heart is at rest, all right? So, at rest, diastolic is at rest. Systolic is, like, against resistance or against activity so all right so what should be the normal 120 over 80 120 over 80 is that clear so if we have like 120 over 90 so what does that mean the heart at rest is working as if the heart is running am i making sense so that's not good so the heart has to have a phase for activity a phase for rest is that clear so 120 is a good thing like when you're like in an activity 120, okay, it's it's like good. And then when you're not working, so you should be like 80. But like when you're 100, when you're not working, so what happen, What happens? Like the heart is even at rest, working against resistance. There is no rest, in other words. Even the rest period is work for the heart. Is that clear? So this can lead into stroke, for example. That's not safe. Am I making sense? Okay, so, okay. All right, so uh, cardiac output factors affecting the blood pressure is the cardiac output, peripheral resistance, blood volume, blood viscosity, arterial elasticity. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about the cardiac output. What is the cardiac output? So like, you know, this is the, this is the heart. All right, so we said this is, uh, the, these are the chambers here. So this is the tricuspid, this is the mitral, and then we have the pulmonic valve here and then the aortic valve here, all right? So this is the left ventricle. All right, so now this is like the aorta, it like goes like this. And then down, down, all right? So the heart, it's coming out and it's that the aorta is going down. And then um, uh, tooth, 
two fingers above the umbilicus. This is the umbilicus, two fingers above the umbilicus, aorta bifurcates and goes to the legs. All right, so like now we have, these are going to the legs. All right, so this is the, the aorta is coming out of the aortic valve here and then going down. All right, so now it is, what is the cardiac output? The amount of the blood that is coming out of the left ventricle, that's the cardiac output. All right, so what is the cardiac output? Cardiac output is equal to heart rate at times the stroke volume. Is this clear? All right, so the cardiac output is the heart rate times the stroke volume, all right? So it depends like how many times the heart is pumping. So it will determine how much blood is gonna be going out into peripheral perfusion. Remember that old man that had the heart rate of 40? So how is his cardiac output? Is very low, right? Why? Because there is little, if the heart rate is low, the cardiac output is gonna be low. Do you see? If the heart rate is up, the cardiac output is gonna be up. When you're running, what happens to your heart rate? It goes up. So what happens to your cardiac output? It goes up. Why do you need more cardiac output? Because you're putting more stress on the muscles, right? So the muscles are running, the toes are running, even the toes are asking for more blood because they're running, <laughs> they're moving. Do, do, you, do you agree? So now if they need more blood, <coughs> so what is the heart gonna do? The heart to start pumping faster so that more blood can be going out of the heart, pumping out of the heart to go to peripheral circulation. That's why their blood pressure is lower because they don't need a cardiac up. Because if you're running right now, all right, so you need more cardiac up, but what's going to happen to your heart rate? It's going to go up. Mm -hmm. If you run every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, and then so what is the body's going to say? You know, like I can't keep like working hard, hard, hard. I don't want to increase the heart rate. What do I need to increase? Stroke the stroke volume. volume. Am I making sense? Sorry about this, guys. I think something irritated me. Okay. So now, um, so if 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 you're running, so you need more cardiac output, right? Mm -hmm. If you need more cardiac output, how is the body cope? <coughs> need that cardiac output by increasing the heart rate. By increasing the heart rate. But if you're an athlete, every day, every day, every day, you're going to be running. Your heart rate, your heart rate, your heart rate. What is the body gonna say? You know, like the heart rate, if it's going more than 100, it, there is the, the potential for going into arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. So for this not to happen, what's gonna happen? Now, okay, if I need cardiac output, so I can't increase the heart rate, I should increase the other component. What is the other component? The stroke volume. So the athletes, their size of the heart is bigger. But if you look like on x-ray because the x-ray shows the landmarks, the echo shows the size of the heart, but this heart is not a sick heart. In heart failure, the heart is big, but it's a sick heart. Am I making sense? So there is a difference. So the stroke volume of an athlete is bigger, like the heart size is bigger, it's more than a fist, but it's not, it's not diseased. But the other one, like with the heart failure, it's big, but it's like there's, 
cardiomegaly and then got, there is cardiomyopathy. The muscle is useless muscle, in other words. It's big, but it's useless. For the reason people with heart, uh, congestive heart failure, they're sick. You know, you're limiting your soul, then you, you, you go to, into congestion, we'll discuss that when we do the heart uh, in the 307. Yes, uh, Genevieve. Is that hypertrophy? <clears throat> Which one? When your heart gets bigger as an athlete? No. No, it's not hypertrophy. It's like, it's, uh, it's not that very big. I mean, it's, it's bigger just to accommodate the activities of that athlete. It's yeah, but it's, 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 it's size-wise big, but the muscle-wise is strong muscle because it developed over time. I mean, it, it didn't happen in one year. It, it developed over the years because like that was anticipated from the body to perform and the body adapted to that need. Okay. Am I making sense? So the bigger heart increases stroke volume because the ventricle is bigger? So now there's The muscle more... is, right. The ventricle is bigger. Yeah, so now there's more blood. Blood, blood coming out, out. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but like it's a, it's a good adaptation in mm -hmm. other words. It's not sickness. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Did I make sense? Yeah. So the way that the heart is able to decrease the heart rate is by increasing stroke volume because of the size of the heart. And the way that the heart does not become diseased or stays healthy is because the coronary arteries are adapted, adapted to supply more oxygen, oxygen to the heart. Oxygen to the left ventricle. Because Very the good. muscles are bigger. Yeah, muscles are bigger. Excellent. Because this didn't happen in one day. Like It was like ongoing demand on the heart and the, the, the heart adapted to it. Okay. All right, so uh, so then peripheral resistance, what is the peripheral resistance? So in other words, when uh, there is a, <clears throat> if there is this patient, if there is uncontrolled hypertension, so what is it? It's uh, when, the, the, when the blood is coming out of here, <coughs> so what are you anticipating? The pressure is higher, the pressure is higher because like, ah, like I'm squeezing a lot of pressure, it's gonna come out of the aorta. What are you anticipating the walls of the aorta to do? Stretch. A stretch, expand, right? So stretch and expand, and then the lumen to be bigger, right? So that the blood can like easily flow, right? Okay, so now this is, uh, there is a situation here. There is uh, arteriosclerosis. What is arteriosclerosis? The okay. blood walls, vessel walls are thick. All right, so this is coming out with a big pressure. So what happens? Because like it's thick walls, it doesn't expand. It's like a garden hose. Okay, like it's rigid. It's not expanding. So what is that gonna do? It's gonna increase the peripheral resistance. You know, I guess this, this uh, left ventricle is a squeezing to push the blood out, and then this rigid walls are pushing the blood back. Am I making sense? Are you with me? So that rigidity of the walls, what is it called? Peripheral resistance. Are you with me, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the peripheral resistance. So in other words, peripheral resistance matters. How this blood is going to be going out through the aorta to, 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 towards peripheral perfusion. So if there is peripheral resistance, so what happens to the systolic blood pressure? goes up, goes up, all right, goes up, okay, so that's, that's the peripheral resistance, blood volume, blood viscosity, and then arterial elasticity, so kind of we, we <coughs> covered it, okay, so, uh, where is it hypertension, if it's more than 140 over 90? Okay, all right, let me, this is the heart failure. Let me explain this. Let me explain this. Okay, guys. <clears throat> okay. Peripheral resistance. Okay. Now, 
I gave you one example about peripheral resistance. What was the reason of the peripheral resistance in the example that I gave you? Arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis, very good. So what is arteriosclerosis? Beginning of the artery. Yeah, rigidity. Rigidity, rigidity, rigidity. of the artery, uh, the, the vessel. So that increases the peripheral resistance. What else? Like the what else? Like from the outside? The viscosity. Viscosity, yeah. yeah. Who has viscous blood? Oh, like Uncontrolled diabetics, viscous blood. Yeah. Uncontrolled diabetes, how is their blood? It's viscous. Is that thick? It's thick. It's thick. Yeah. It's thick because a lot have blood sugars. So somebody with uncontrolled diabetes, their blood is thicker. Okay. Thicker, you know why it's thicker? Okay, let's look this. This is like the, this is the test tube, right? This is test tube. This is test tube. Now you put the blood here. This is the blood. All right, so now this is a patient with uncontrolled diabetes. We got the blood. Are you with me? We put this in the centrifuge, right? In the lab, and then it's turning, right? So what happens? It's gonna divide the cells from the water. All right, so now we're gonna have this. Okay, this is the test tube. All right, here 10%, this is gonna be the cells. 90%, it's gonna be the water. What is water called? Plasma. Plasma. Are you with me, guys? Mm -hmm. All right, now, this is a patient with diabetes uncontrolled. Okay, we collected the blood, put it in the centrifuge, now we got this. This is the cell. What is the cell? White blood cells, red blood cells, everything is here. This is the water. So this water is not like uh, clear, it means it's a little bit yellow. yeah, yellowish, you know. Okay, so this is the plasma, all right. So now if it's, if you take this plasma, I mean, if you taste it, obviously we're not tasting it, it's gonna be very sugary, does that make sense? So in other words, there is a lot of sugar here. And then this is thick plasma. Am I making sense? I mean, I explain this all the time to the patient. Oh, I'm taking aspirin. Aspirin is working here on the cells. Aspirin cannot do anything to the plasma. Am I making sense? So the viscosity of uncontrolled patients with diabetes, their plasma is full of sugar, and this is a thick, thick honey. Imagine that it's a clear honey. Honey is like darker, but this is like a whiter creamier does that make sense so this is like a very thick like you need to take it it's 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 like a honey am i making sense so this is viscous are you with me guys mm -hmm. yeah the blood thinner is working here the blood thinner it's working on the cells not on the plasma are you with me, guys? So don't confuse it. This is every time I teach diabetes class, the patients, oh, I'm taking blood thinner. Blood thinner, nothing to do with the plasma and the sugar in the plasma. Are you with me, guys? Blood thinner works on the cells. Aspirin, where does it work? It doesn't let the platelets to aggregate. What is a platelet? It's a cell. It's working here on the cell. Nothing to do here. The cumadin, where does it work? You know, on the factors. Factors are like part of the cells. Am I making sense, guys? So nothing to do here. Explain this to patients like they don't understand because they say, oh, I'm on a blood thinner. Why is my blood is viscous? Because the sugar is mixed with the plasma. Okay. So insulin will work on the plasma? Insulin, insulin will, yes, will help the sugar from the plasma to be used by the cells for energy. Yes, yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. So, can you explain hematocrit a little bit? Hematocrit? Yeah. So, when we have an increase in, so hematocrit's the percentage of red blood cells in the plasma? Yes. So, if we have high hematocrit, the blood is thicker? No. Nothing to do with the thicker. That's hypovolemia, hypervolemia. The, the, you're, you're right, you, you have between like, you know, the hematocrit and the hemo hematocrit is the ratio between the cell and the plasma, but nothing to do the plasma being sugary or not sugary. If somebody's, if, if uh, there is a pregnant woman, like, you know, like if like, uh, 
So this is going to be 70% plasma, 30% cell. That's the normal. All right. So when this girl becomes pregnant, so what happens with pregnancy? There is more water. There is more water. So in other words, the cells are the same. Nothing changed with the cells. All right. So what happens to the hematocrit? Now you have less of a cell because you have more of a volume. Am I making sense? But the girl didn't change. She didn't lose any blood or anything. All she did, because of the pregnancy, she gained water. So the, the cell ratio before pregnancy, after pregnancy changes. Why? Because the cells were this much in this much of water. Now the same amount of cell is this much water. So that cell, it becomes insignificant in a bucket. But the same cell was in the bottle. The girl didn't change. All the pregnancy, what did it do? It gained more water. Now, instead of having like one bottle of water, you're having one bucket of water. So you're going to be comparing the ratio between the same amount of cell to this amount of cell. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So the hematocrit changes because of hypervolemia. So just blood volume, basically. The blood volume became bigger. The plasma amount became bigger, so the cell amount became insignificant. That's how the hematocrit changed. It's like a proportion? Proportion changed. But the girl didn't lose any blood. It's like a normal physiology. She gained water because she's carrying a fetus. Am I making sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we are dehydrated, our blood is more viscous? That, that affects, dehydration affects the hematocrit. You have less water, more cell this time. Okay, so the hematocrit changes. So hematocrit determines either you are hypovolemic or hypervolemic. Is this pregnancy is hypervolemia. Dehydration is hypovolemia. The hematocrit changes because the cell is floating in a different amount of volume. But the cell is not changed. You're the same woman. <laughs> that, am I making sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for labs, um, for a person that's dehydrated, their hematocrit will be low. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. So, but in the diabetes, the viscosity, the plasma is having a lot of sugar. Nothing to do with the volume of the plasma. The, the volume is there, but like it's thick with sugar. Okay, guys. Are you understanding? These are difficult concepts, but like, are you at least like... Uh, Getting it, yeah. I think when you read it, it's going to be more easy to understand because, like, I kind of gave you some foundation. Okay, guys. Okay, let me explain. How many slides are left? Okay. Two. Two more left. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oh, okay. All right. So, like, I can explain it then. Okay. So, uh, the the, the mm -hmm. let me explain the stroke volume, the stroke volume of an athlete, and then the stroke volume of a patient who has congestive heart failure. Is that clear, guys? Okay. Now, all this, whatever it's written here, I'm going to be explaining it in, in a simpler way. Okay. So now, uh, let's say, and then also. Body weight adds to peripheral resistance also. All right, so the obesity, like, you know, like if, uh, obesity or like, for the reason, when, you're, uh, when you have a patient with high blood pressure, what are you saying? Exercise, weight loss, low, low salt, right? So this is a classic uh, in instructions that we say, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now, so let's say the peripheral resistance, it can be thickening of the walls of the vessels, it can be weight, Okay, so uh, okay, so weight adds to uh, weight adds to uh, peripheral resistance, and then okay, so weight adds to peripheral resistance. What else? Salt adds to peripheral resistance. Why? Because salt. Well, every time there is salt, it will absorb water. So you're retaining more water. So water is weight, so like it's going to be adding to peripheral resistance. Am I making sense? So these are all factors that affect the peripheral resistance. Okay, now look at this. So now this ventricle is squeezing and it's going to be pushing the blood out, right? So normally, what are we anticipating for the aortic walls to do? Expand, stretch. We, we said it. 
Why? Because the blood that is coming out of the left ventricle, it's coming with a big pressure. So what do, what do you anticipate the vessels to do? Expand, and then so like, okay, I'm expanding, come flow within me, right? So that there is no blood pressure. Okay, so what happens that there is this, this, uh, this person has, let's say, peripheral resistance. Now this left ventricle is squeezing the blood and then pushing it out. If there is peripheral resistance here, what is it gonna do? It's gonna push back. Are you with me? It's not expanding, it's not expanding, it's not letting the blood to flow. What is it doing? Oh, like don't come, this is like pushing, oh, and then the other one say, come down. I'm pushing it out, and they, because there is peripheral resistance, like it's pushing it down again. Are you with me? Yeah. So there is a struggle. What does the left ventricle say? So you know, like I can't give up. I need to push this blood out because everybody in the body is waiting for this blood, right? So what is it doing? The more the peripheral resistance, this, uh, this muscle is uh, like stretching, stretching, stretching and stretching. So every time, now like the muscle is stretching so much, you know, like that is not normal anymore. Is this clear? So now with the, the muscle is stretching, neurohormonal changes are happening. Neurohormonal changes. All right, so the BNP and ANP are being released. released. All right, so what is it? Uh, this is nutriuretic peptides. Okay, BNP and ANP. I don't know, I mean, it's, it's a long word. Okay, so BNP and ANP. So these, these are very much specific to the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. Other, renin is also, renin is also, aldosterone is also released. Renin and aldosterone are released because the left ventricle is under so much stress. What does that, this mean? The left ventricle is saying that, oh, like all my energy, let me push, let me push. And then there is peripheral resistance. So now like at the time this left ventricle is under the stress and then I'm pushing it up. Okay, so all this, renin is uh, getting released, aldosterone is released, new, new, uh, natriuretic peptides are released, BNP and ANP. But we focus on this, not the renin, and then not the aldosterone, you know why? Because this is only significant associated to the left ventricle. They don't get out to the system other than when the left ventricle is under stress. It's a specific. But the renin and the others, they are released in other situations. So for that reason, we don't depend on them. Am I making sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So this ANP and then BNP and then BNP, when they're released, so the body gets a message. What's the message? Left ventricle is under a stretch, under a stress and stretching to its fullest. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So now, neurohormonal changes are happening. So what is the body thinking? This left ventricle is under a stress. So, what is the solution? The solution is, the brain is gonna say, all right, so if I add more muscle here, the more the muscle, the more the force I will have. Are you with me? Okay. So, I mean, the best, the best correction is take your blood pressure medication, right? But people do not take their blood pressure medication, right? So, okay, so if you didn't take your blood pressure medication and then the peripheral resistance existed, so now this left ventricle is under a lot of the stress, like it's stretching to push this blood out, but I can't. So what am I gonna do? I need more muscle. If I have more muscle, I can carry more weight. Are you with me? So because of the BNP and ANP, neurohormonal changes happen and more muscle starts adding on the left ventricle. Are you with me? This doesn't happen in one day, guys, right? It's happening over time, yeah. 
So what does B and P and A and P stand I said Google it. I don't know. Like it's a long word. It's we the brain that 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you go, when the patients come with the difficulty of breathing and then they're not diagnosed, they check the BMP and the AMP levels. If they're elevated by like more than one, it should be less than 100. Anything more than 100 is abnormal. Is that clear, guys? So we shouldn't be having AMP and BNP going in our system because it kind of the, the left ventricle is working fine. It should be less than one person. Anything more, it's already like the left ventricle is stretching. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. Um, so if you have the peripheral resistance and the left ventricle closes, but it's being put, the blood is being pushed back, um, why would taking blood pressure medication itself. It will, it, the blood pressure medication reduces the peripheral resistance. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. blood pressure medication reduces the peripheral resistance. Definitely. Yeah, yes. What is this condition or disease called? What is it? What is this disease called? Like where the, the ventricle... Hey, it's heart failure. Yeah, heart failure. We're going to have a heart failure. So, you know, it's mainly the BNP. The ANP is still like, we're, it's not used that much, like the BNP. So BNP should be less than 100. So if somebody comes like to the ER and then they're having uh, uh, difficulty breathing because that's how like they come to the ER, they check the BNP levels. Like it should be less than 100. If it's more, they know that like it, it, uh, it is left ventricle is stretched already. And then so there is a potential for the person having a congestive heart failure. Is that clear? So now, so now what happens that the body is like uh, the left ventricle is having more muscle here. So like the muscle becomes big. And then the person from outside doesn't feel anything because like, guess what? You know, I have peripheral resistance, but my heart is adapting to it. It's making more muscle. And the more muscle, it's pushing against the resistance. And the blood is going through the aorta and then it's going to the peripheral circulation, we're good, we're good, right? And then life is going on. But like how long this neurohormonal changes are gonna be adding more muscle? So what happened to the size of the heart here? It grew. It, it grew. So like when you're doing echo or chest x-ray, even chest x-ray, it shows the landmark of the heart. The chest x-ray, when you're taking a picture, so the picture of the heart it should be this much, or the picture is this much. So it shows cardiomegaly. Does that make sense? So a picture, because it, X-ray is a picture. So it shows a bigger picture heart, right? So that is cardiomegaly, cardiomegaly. So it's that the heart is big. But now, you know, like, okay, so this is this much heart muscle. So what happens to your stroke volume? Somebody was asking here. The stroke volume becomes big too. Right? For that reason, the cardiac output equals to heart rate times the stroke volume. Do you see the stroke volume became big also? But in this case, what, how did the stroke volume become big? By adding more muscle meat. This is not normal. This is not normal. Because this meat became added because the patient was under distress. This wasn't a normal meat added. Am I making sense now? All right, so there, there will come a time and we'll say enough. I cannot add any more meat, that's it. All right, so what's gonna happen? This muscle is gonna say, you know what, like, I don't even have energy anymore, like I'm not gonna push. So what happens to this muscle now? Cardiomyopathy. At the beginning it was cardiomegaly, it was like big heart, but all this muscle is added muscle because the body was under distress. Am I making sense? So it wasn't a healthy heart, in other words. So now, because that extra muscle is there, and that extra muscle is gonna say, you know, I cannot, I cannot push, I don't have any energy. So now the patient has <laughs> cardiomyopathy. So there is a big heart, and it's not working. Is that clear, guys? Cardio yeah. Myopathy. Myopathy. Yeah, cardiomyopathy is like that added muscle is useless now. So now you have cardiomegaly and cardiomyopathy. So myo is muscle and pathy is like disease, like muscle disease on the heart? Yeah. Is that right? I, yeah, I think right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. So now this patient is going to be having... Um, 
that's it. They're going to be having uh, congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. for hypertension, age, alcohol, cigarette smoking, disease, the diabetes mellitus, okay, so elevated serum lipids, excess dietary sodium, gender, family history, obesity, ethnicity, sedentary lifestyle. Okay, let's, let's, let's see what else is. Oh, let me talk a little bit since we have time. All right, let me talk a little bit. Um, age, all right, so what happens with age, okay, let me, uh, okay, so age, there is going to be more a stiffness of the blood vessels uh, because of age. Cigarette smoking, what does it do? It creates more sputum that you're. And as far as vessels. Oh, it burns. Doesn't make Spastic. Spastic. It makes it spastic. Diabetes, all right, so let, let's go with the serum. What is lipids doing? They, okay, so what lipids do. What lipids do, okay, so the cholesterol comes and like, you know, oh, uh, oh, sticks to the back. inner walls, all right? So cholesterol comes and sticks here, all right? So cholesterol comes and sticks here. So what happens, the lumen gets smaller, all right? So every time like there is, there is cholesterol here, and when the blood is, when the blood is going through this, vessel that the walls are all stuck with cholesterol. So there is a potential for the platelets to come and aggregate. The platelets come and then sit and then make like a kind of family reunion here. <laughs> all right, so the platelets come and then aggregate. Okay, they're doing family reunion. Okay, so what happened now? You have a cholesterol on top of it, you have platelets that is aggregated. So what happened to the lumen? It gets even narrower. Does that make sense? Are you with me, guys? So for that reason, now when they're taking the aspirin, so aspirin, okay, so what is aspirin doing? It's not letting the platelets to aggregate around the cholesterol. It's not letting the family reunion to happen. Are you with me? So for the reason, like, that's how it helps less platelets to come on top of the cholesterol that is already blocking the woman. Are you with me, guys? So that's how it helps, all right? So... So the narrower the lumen, there's gonna be higher the blood pressure because it's gonna affect the peripheral resistance. Are you with me? Yeah. So, uh, so that's that. Yes, uh, fine. Oh, fine. Uh, I was just um, thinking, um, so with the platelets and the blood clots forming, would that push the blood back into the heart and cause the heart to... Well, grow? the key is like, it's what's, what is this doing? It's decreasing the lumen. All right, so I mean, if the lumen is smaller, so like the blood is gonna come out, look at the, the neck, look at the road, it's narrow. Mm -hmm. Narrow road, it's gonna back up. Yes, you're right. It's gonna add to the peripheral resistance. Uh -huh. Is this clear? So would it, uh, the myocardial get bigger in the left ventricle? What is it? Oh, uh, the, the muscle in the left ventricle, would that increase too because of Yes, that? yes, oh, yeah, yeah, this, the, the, are you saying that this will lead into congestive heart failure? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, obviously, if there is cholesterol, on top of it, there is platelet. On top of it, there is arteriosclerosis. It's gonna to contribute higher to peripheral resistance than someone who only has the cholesterol. Am I making sense? Right, okay. So. Excess sodium is going to be uh, adding to more, what's that, water. So it's going to be adding weight. All right, so the other thing is, oh, obesity, we said it already. Ethnicity, so like African Americans, they're higher, they're more prone of having hypertension. All right, so in other words, the race of, uh, has a fact also. Um, socioeconomic status, why? Um, nutrition. nutrition, okay, so like the, uh, probably they don't eat healthier because like it's uh, fast food is like more accessible, it's affordable, right? Okay, because anything outside that you're eating, the salt also is higher. Okay, 
Let me talk a little bit about the diabetes, like how it makes the blood vessels thick. All right. So uh, last time uh, during nutrition class, I think I explained. All right, so when we're eating the food, where does it go? To the stomach, right? So what happens in the stomach, the food is being digested. And now like it's gonna be turning into sugar and then the sugar is gonna come out of the stomach. As soon as the sugar comes out of the stomach, what do we have behind the stomach? The pancreas. So how big is the stomach? Fist size. How big is the pancreas? Thumb size, like this. There are two organs, they're here, right? Okay, so the sugar comes out of the stomach right away from the pancreas, uh, insulin comes out because insulin is already ready and then it's waiting for the blood sugar to come out, the insulin comes out. That is called first phase insulin release. All right, so it comes out. Now they're together. One is the sugar, one is the insulin. I explained this last time, remember? Mm -hmm. So they go to the brain first, then they go to the muscles. Then the third station is the liver. What happens in the liver? Glucose turns into glycogen, glycogen and the stores there. How much glycogen can be stored in the liver? 360 grams. So that's the max. Imagine the liver is a warehouse, but like it has a cap. It has only limited shelves to put the glycogen there. Are you with me, guys? So after 360 grams of sugar that is turned into glycogen, excess sugar, what happens? Turns into fat and comes and sits on the abdomen. And then, so over time, we're gonna be having a bumpy abdomen. What is that called? Central obesity, central obesity. Is that clear, guys? Now, every time, like, you know, so if the lifestyle continues, there is no exercise, because every time we're exercising, what happens is that these fat cells, they shrink. They shrink, and then hopefully over time, they're gonna burn, okay? They don't burn in one day, right? Okay, so it's gonna shrink, 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 and then burn. All right, so, but like if there is no exercise, there is sedentary lifestyle. So those uh, fat cells are there, they're sitting, right? So now, and then an, a new fat cell comes and says, so I'm gonna sit here. The old fat cells, what do they say? There is no more space. There is no more space. There is no more. I mean, it's a bumpy abdomen, it's full. It's kind of complete. There is no more space, right? So what's gonna happen that one of the old fat cells, it's gonna come out and say, okay, come take my seat. Are you with me, guys? All right, so that fat cell that it was old and then BB was like kind to let his or her, I don't know, the fat cell is a girl. Or... <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, now, like, this is a controversial subject. <laughs> like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I'm being recorded. <laughs> Okay, okay, so it's uh, nothing funny, all right. <laughs> all right, now, okay, so the fat cell comes out and then says, okay, come take my space. So this, there is a new fat cell that freed itself, went to the blood. So what is the name of this fat cell that freed itself? It's very easy. No. Free fatty acid. No. <laughs> so free fatty acid. So if the free fatty acid comes out, all right, and then the new fat cell comes, sits here. Now, where is the free fatty acid? In the blood. In the blood. Free fatty acid. Where did it come from? Abdomen. Abdomen. The central obesity. Do you see why central obesity is dangerous? All right, why? Because it has a lot of fat cells. And then, so like it is being detached, and then so that it will, okay, I'm coming out. You can come take my space, right? So this, the name of this fat cell is what? Free fatty acid. Are you with me, guys? Mm -hmm. So free fatty acid, where is it? In the blood. In the blood. So what is it going to do? Yeah, but like the most accumulated is the abdomen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously. But like the, the one that is like on the abdomen is the most, because that's the first place they go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now the free fatty acid is in the blood. Now... What are they gonna do? Are they gonna do something good or bad? Bad. Bad, you already know it, right? So what do they have? They have a baby. VLDL. VLDL. VLDL is very low density lipoprotein. This is the bad cholesterol and it's very much kind of condensed. All right, so now the VLDL is gonna have a baby too. 
What's the name of the baby? Triglyceride. Now, do you see because of that bumpy abdomen, what's happening to your blood lipid levels? You're increasing your triglyceride. Do you see this? Now, when it is like the triglyceride, okay, there is too many triglyceride. What is the triglyceride gonna do? I mean, obviously the nickname of the triglyceride is bad fat. So it's gonna be doing something bad. How does sugar and the insulin work? Okay, the sugar is the girlfriend and then the insulin is the boyfriend. They're working together, right? So what is the insulin's role? What do the men do? Open the door for the women, right? So like the insulin opens the door, the, uh, the sugar goes into the cell, right? And now this triglyceride goes to the cells and it starts breaking the locks of the cells. Am I making sense? So insulin can't open the, the next day, you know, sugar and insulin, they're going, you know, the insulin is going to try to open the door of the cell. It's not opening because the day before the triglyceride broke it. Does that make sense? So what is this called? Insulin resistance. Do you see now how the central obesity leads into insulin resistance? Do you see the connection now? So now the central obesity leads into insulin resistance because free fatty acids are going to be generating triglycerides and triglycerides are going to be breaking the lock of the door of the cells. Now your own insulin goes to open, it cannot open. Why? Because the triglyceride broke it the day before. Am I making sense, guys? So now what is this called? Insulin resistance. Now this insulin that cannot open the door is in perplexed position. See, how can I cannot open the door? Like I can, I was able to open the door. Like why can I open the door? Now where is that insulin gonna reach out? Where did the insulin came from? Pancreas. Okay, so it's gonna call cell phone. Okay, like I'm gonna call the pancreas, right? I'm at the door. I cannot open the door, right? So like it's perplexed. So who is the, who is this insulin gonna call? The pancreas. Pancreas, pancreas, what happened? I cannot open the door. And then like I have my girl with me, she cannot <laughs> enter the room, right? All right, so now what happens to the postperennial blood sugar right now? It's elevated already, right? Okay, but the pancreas says, okay, calm down, I'm gonna help you. The, is, uh, the, the pancreas sends like a, a crew of insulin, not only one, a few insulin, where to the, to the side. And then one of them opens, the other one tries to open, the third one tries to open, and it goes, the sugar goes in. The sugar goes in. All right, so when you check the blood sugar before meal, next meal, what is the blood sugar? Normal again. Does that make sense? Why the, the pancreas helped? By sending more insulin to the site. Am I making sense? Okay, so just take a deep breath now. How many new insulins came to the site? Only one or a crew? A crew. A crew. Do we need a crew? No. We didn't want any, even one, let alone a crew. We all we wanted that the, the first insulin to open the door, right? We didn't want any crew and, and we didn't want any extra insulin. Over time, with all this crew of insulins in the blood, what do they do? They thicken the walls of the vessels. Do you see now why diabetics have hypertension? Is, that, is, is it making sense now? Mm -hmm. So, all right, so at the time of the diagnosis, this, this process goes seven to 10 years. The body fights for 10 years to keep this euglycemia. Every time there is a call from the side to the pancreas, I can't open the door, I can't open the door, the pancreas makes new insulin, a crew goes. I can make, then the pancreas says, wait a minute, like this is seven years every time you're calling me and I'm tired. Like, you know, I'm always working harder to send you insulin. Does that make sense? I cannot send you any more insulin. That day the blood sugar goes up. But when did the problem started? Seven years ago. And the meantime, how much of a crew of insulin was generated? A lot. So what did these insulins do? They thicken the walls of this vessel here. So what do we have here? Arteriosclerosis. Do you see? Arteriosclerosis. What is arteriosclerosis? The vessel wall is thick. Is that clear, guys? Now, but if there is a lot of fat here like this, what is this called? Arteriosclerosis. 
Okay, so in other words, they are in, the, the, in literature they are used interchangeably, but they're not the same. Arteriosclerosis is the thickening of the wall of the vessel. Insulin, too much insulin causes arteriosclerosis. Are you with me, guys? Mm -hmm. And then the fat is atherosclerosis because in Greek, ateroma means plug. So that's how I remember. Is this clear? Both atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, it leads into increase of peripheral pressure. Do you see now why this patient is going to be more prone of developing heart failure? Because he has like already arteriosclerosis on top of it. There is arteriosclerosis on top of it. The patient is from an ethnicity that like is high, high, high potential sedentary lifestyle and still he's eating like uh, food that is not very healthy. So they're going to lead into a, a high blood pressure that is going to be leading to heart failure. Okay, and, guys. And is that the reason why some people accidentally like die because of they injected the insulin incorrectly? Or th there is no injection of no, insulin. No, no, no. You know how insulin, when you inject insulin huh. to bring down your huh. sugar levels, um, the reason I'm asking is because I had a friend whose father passed away by injecting too much insulin. It could because like there is hype, uh, he, he had hypoglycemia unawareness then. Because usually, if it is low, then you have symptoms like you're sweating, like you know, so your heart is palpating. But sometimes in the sleep, these symptoms do not show up, and then the person dies. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. There, too much insulin kills. I mean, if that's the 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 the, the question, yes, because the blood uh, brain cells cannot live without sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this was helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, okay, guys, do you know like how many years I studied to come up with this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, guys, yeah, but the class is dismissed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right.